Good morning, everyone. My name is Shriti. I'm 27 years old, third of my name, founder of a construction company, an avid reader, and a holder of books, and also a self-proclaimed connoisseur of street food. So when I was called or invited to be a speaker here, for a week I couldn't understand if I should say yes or no, because I had no idea what I could contribute to the subject, which is power to change. And then literally a day before we had to send in our draft for the speech, I sat down to write it down. Still, nothing came into my mind until finally the pressure of the deadline made me realize that the only thing I'm actually an expert about is my own choices, or to put it more dramatically, my own journey. So I'll start with my own journey. It was 2010, I was 18 years old, and I had figured it all, and I mean it. I knew that I'm gonna somehow get 95% in my board examination, go to Lady Sri Ram College in DU, study economics, and then right after that, go and do my masters in LSE, and then work in World Bank. I had figured out the college, the organization, everything. And that to me in that time of frame of mind felt like I would make a difference. Then, of course, I didn't get 95%. I didn't get at all a percentage that could get me into any of the North Campus colleges, leave alone LSR. That was a big blow to my confidence because always throughout my childhood, I was in the top 5% of the class. And here, I had such a clear trajectory of what I wanted to do and now there was just no part to get there. Had I waited for a few months, I could have got into the second waiting list and get into still a college where I could study economics. But I was stubborn. I was so hell-bent in studying in LSR that I didn't care about the subject enough and I decided I won't study economics at all. As an Indian kid with an Indian parent, we always have a plan B. And of course, what better plan B as an Indian than to study engineering? So, uh, so I was also on the back end preparing for engineering while I was giving my board examination. And of course, because I never had my heart in engineering, I couldn't crack ITJ or AIEEE or any of the national examinations. But I somehow cleared the state level examination of UP and I decided to study engineering because I wasn't doing economics. I got into a college, I chose a branch, civil, without knowing why. So unfortunately, unlike my amazing speaker before me, I had nothing figured out when I was 18. I go to the school, and this is the chart. Uh, so if I could sum up my four years in college, it'll be very few words. I was disengaged, curious, slightly all over the place, and finally figuring it out. And that line is my attendance when I was in uh, engineering school, which you can see, was never more than 60, 70%. I just never really uh, went to class that often. So the first year of my college was very similar to someone who has just had a breakup. I didn't care about anything. I would go to the class, not listen to the teacher, sit at the back seat, come back. For my whole first year, I didn't even know who my roommate was or where she was from because I just felt that I'm going to waste my four life years and make no difference and then just, you know, go on with my life because my plan is already gone. Then something happened in second year. I went to a class as always late, but the faculty for the first time noticed me and he made me sit on the first seat. And this was a class called Reinforced Concrete Structures. This professor was 70 years old, a retired person from sale, and most of the time people could not even understand what he was speaking. But something happened in my case. I got interested. And I don't use this word lightly because for the first time there was a subject in second year that made me come to class. Still, the only one subject. Other classes, I kept bunking. <laughs> so, second year of my college was slightly getting curious about one subject. And again, to put it in a dramatic fashion, I felt that this material, concrete, is the most versatile thing in the world. Because when I started studying it in depth, I realized that if you look around yourself, it can be turned into any form and shape. It can hold any amount of strength, any amount of load. And we can make anything physical out of it. And I read a quote by Winston Churchill that said, you shape your surroundings and thereafter you shape yourself. And I was so desperate to find something that I could do as, you know, a meaningful thing to make a change. I thought, okay, I found a subject that will help me do that. Third year, because I no more could study that subject, we went on to another subject and I had lost my interest in class again. So I started doing everything else in the school, um, college, other than going to class, which was debating, forming a literature society because I didn't want to join the engineering clubs. 
And finally, when fourth year happened, when people were figuring out what to do, I was clueless. I didn't want to get a job because I wasn't interested in any of the subjects. And when I talked to my professor, he told me that if I want to design concrete structures, it's going to at least take me six, seven years to work as a junior engineer before I could do that. So I was like, so if it's going to take me a year, so many years before I design one structure, what's the point? And then because I always felt limited in that physical space, in that city where I was studying, which was in Meerut Highway, you know, between Meerut and Ghazibad, I thought, how about I go for a master's abroad and try to study more in depth construction and maybe that would help me figure it out. So I started studying GRE, I wrote my examination, I got decent scores and I got a scholarship to go to NYU. Next thing, I could sum up, I don't need four words, I can just use one word to sum up my whole experience while I was in New York, which is to explore. I made up my mind that when I get to New York, I'm going to make as less friends as Indians possible. Now, I'm sorry, I don't want to be racist to our own race, but where I was coming from is that if I'm getting an opportunity to be in the most diverse city in the world, I want to make the most of it. I want to learn everything that is there and ex expose myself to all kind of diversity possible. I made friends from different cultures. I studied subjects that had nothing to do with engineering because that was the benefit that those universities offer you, unlike Indian. So I studied engineering, I studied entrepreneurship, design thinking, philosophy. I went to classes without being graded for them. And at the same time, I somehow, yes, again graduated and this time had a much decent attendance. And I also landed up a job. So in one and a half years, I finished my master's, I landed up a job. And my company was even willing to uh, file for my H1. That's an Indian American dream, right? You go to states and some company is willing to file your H1 and you also get that. But right when I started my job, few months into it, I realized something. And the next word that's going to be on the slide is can somehow explain our whole generation, which is boredom. I got bored, as we all do often. And I realized that I wasn't happy with my job. I loved my job. I want to make it clear I was not one of those engineers who was frustrated with their job. I finally loved it. I was happy doing it. The pay was great. My boss was awesome. But I felt something was missing. And one day during a lunch break, a friend of mine back in India told me that there's a fellowship happening in India which gives you the freedom to do whatever you want for a year with one twist. You have to live in a village and do that. So I was like, okay. I, the lunch break was going on. There were still 30 minutes left. And I literally opened the website and I applied for the fellowship. I got in, but the next day I had to make a decision. I had to quit my job. I had to move back to India from states and do the fellowship. Now that was a big decision for me. One of the first decisions where I was somehow in control of changing the trajectory of my life. My parents were interested of me coming back. They were happy I'd got my H1 as a typical Indian parent. And, but I didn't want to come back to India. So I just decided to do that. And the one thing that made me do that was something a friend of mine told me, which was, it's OK to make wrong decisions, but it's better than regretting something. And I felt that if I didn't take up this opportunity or this fellowship, I'm going to regret it. So even if it's a wrong decision, and I realize after a year, I wasted a year, that's OK. So I moved back to India. I take that risk. I, I took a flight, I still remember, on 24th September 2016 to Delhi. On 2nd October 2016, my fellowship started in a village called Pandhana in Madhya Pradesh. As soon as I got to the uh, village, now as I mentioned in my introduction, I love reading. And it happens a lot with people who love reading that they believe that they know a lot. I wasn't an exception. But when I got to the village and I was told that you're going to do a two-month need-based assessment, which primarily means you travel to any place that you want, you talk to whoever you want, and then after two months, you figure out a problem that you want to help solve. I thought that's the best thing one can let me do, figure it out with no instruction manual. But in two months, I didn't have a project report to give back to the foundation who was organizing the fellowship. I traveled to 34 villages, and I realized that every village in every corner, there was such a big problem to solve. And when you get into the depth of it, you realize you're not able to. For the first time, I had that moment in my life where I could make a difference and how I felt was completely inadequate to do that. So next thing that I do, did was the only thing I could do was I decided that I'm going to listen. My whole fellowship was about listening. I made no judgments. 
I decided I'm not going to look at this fellowship as something I can put on my CV. I'm not going to look at this fellowship as something that I can take from. I'm just going to live with the people I'm here with in this village, do whatever they're doing. And maybe that's just how this one year would be as a sabbatical. I, I learned how to milk a cow. I learned how to check the health of a goat. I learned how to raise a cow, do cow dung plaster on a wall, and also sow crops with the farmers. I just followed the daily life cycle. That's all was my uh, fellowship because they gave you that freedom. And while we were doing that, me and 480 women came together and we formed a company, a farmer producer organization that, was, that started doing collective goat rearing and poultry business. Again, that was not my idea. That was not something I thought could make a difference. They told me we should do this. I was like, I'm here for one year. I'll do whatever you ask me to. And I did. And somehow, the extra class that I took in entrepreneurship in NYU helped me to help them uh, with the business concepts in that collective marketing business. Next is my favorite line, which is, you have to believe in destiny, as uh, the principal mentioned it when he was giving his speech. One of the days, which was, I think, three months before my fellowship got over, I was with the farmers in the field. We were clearing off the land uh, post a wheat harvest, and I saw them burning the land. Now, because I'd learned my lesson that I have to listen and not speak, I didn't judge them, I didn't question them. But later over the dinner, we discussed it, and I realized that it's common sense that, how, that if you're burning your own topsoil, it's not going to be that productive. And the next season, you're going to put far more input to get the same productivity from the land, but that won't happen. And even if that happens, your input cost is so much that your profits are going to go down, which is the vicious cycle, which is why a small and marginal farmer in India is always debt-ridden. So I could understand the problem. What I couldn't understand, why were they doing that to their own selves? And then they told me that it cost 5,000 rupees to clear an acre of land in India uh, post a harvest to remove the residue, and there is no meaning to that residue. There's nothing you can do with it. It has volume. If you want to store it, you actually need a bigger house than they were living in to store it. So the only sensible option to them was to light a matchstick and burn their own land so that they can sooner clear it off for the next crop because at least they could make something out of that next cycle, but clearly nothing out of clearing the residue. This seemed like a clear economics problem of demand and supply. But what was the solution? So I started doing my own research while I was in the fellowship. And I came to know about a company in Czech Republic, EcoPanly, which for the last 20 years has been trying to compress the same wheat straw that we were burning in Madhya Pradesh, in Europe, in a factory 100 kilometers from Prague, and turning that into a building material. So here I was finally at a position in my life where the six years of my learning of construction seemed to fit in. My love to solve a problem that is close to economics, that is close to livelihood, was there. And I felt I was in a position to contribute. And that's how I decided to work on that. My fellowship got over in November 2017. It was one year long. And right after the fellowship got over, I told my parents that I'm not going to go back to in, uh, States. I'm not going to take a job in India. But at the age of 25, I'm going to start my own construction company with having less than a year of experience in construction whatsoever. And um, that's what I did. And that's how Structure Eco was born. The mission of our company is empowering sustainable construction. We want to build houses that are sustainable, affordable, and accessible to all. And the basic premise of anything being affordable is that it has to be close to where you live. It has to be local. And what could be more local to you as a source of building material but a 100-kilometer farm f close to your city where someone is growing a crop that can eventually be com compressed into a potential building material. So that's the bigger vision that we are working on. That's the first house we built in Gorakhpur, which is where I'm from. It's the first house in India built of compressed agri-fiber panels. Everything that you see above the foundation is panels. There is no concrete, there is no brick, there is no cement used in this house. And we use this as our office. So that is what I want to leave you guys with. I see so many students here, and I started my story from 2010 because I think a lot of you are here right now at that age, about to get to uh, college. And I want to really beg you, if I can, to say that be patient. Be patient with the questions that have no answers right now, but cherish the questions because you cannot find answer to certain things until you live them because sometimes the only way of figuring out it out is by living it. So just cherish the questions, love those questions, and one day, without noticing, 
you might live right into the answer. Thank you.